unpleasant odors? You have just been invaded by Sega TV! Tonight, we bring you... Wildlife! This is Megan, start of a new Sega game. Megan! What's it like to be a Mega CD star? Real tough. You try dying 2,000 times a day. Hey, you! Yeah, you! Billy from Romford. You don't zap her on my show. The weather. The weather is... I say you could do this move. Commercial break. Sega Mega Drive. Got one? Now you can get Mega CD. One click, take the trip. Whoa! It comes with seven games that even plays your music, PD! OK, Megan, let's get interactive. <laughs> <laughs> now that's what I call Mega CD. Oh. Oh, Sega. You're so weird particularly in the 16-bit era, where the goal was to stick as much stuff as possible to your console. Now, we've talked about one of these before, the 32X, an odd-looking device which you put in the cartridge slot, but there was a more well-known add-on called the Sega CD. Now, there was different models for each version of the Mega Drive, and it's perhaps the most well-known early console to use CDs, even if not many people seem to actually own one, probably because of the high price point. Combining both the 32X and the Mega CD would cost a fortune, and you'd have to deal with the embarrassment of the mutants of a console you now own. That being said, the Sega CD has an important part in gaming history, as being one of the sparks that fueled the biggest and most influential gaming rivalries that to this day has a lasting effect on the industry. For this is... Nintendo vs Sony. Seeing the rivalry in today's modern gaming between these two, you'd be forgiven for not realising that at one point they were working quite closely together. In contrast, today they're often throwing cheap comments at each other. You can also see the remnants of the partnership in the company's similar thinking. That's why Sony often does what Nintendo does. At least a lot of the time. Seriously, Sony, come up with something original. Obviously, this partnership didn't last, and because of it, the modern gaming world is very different from what it could have been. The rivalry it created and the aftermath altered the very future of gaming. But enough about that. Let's see how this whole thing happened in the first place. Our tale starts in the year 1988. The Famicom and the NES are dominating the gaming world, and Nintendo are at the top of their game. Meanwhile, the General Electronics Japanese company, Sony, was desperate to enter the now steadily recovering gaming industry. Meet Ken Kutaragi, a young Sony engineer. One day, he went and bought a Famicom for his kids, and while he could see how games had a promising future, he was left unimpressed with the technology, and thus a cunning plan formed. And so, in hope of breaking into their sought-after market, Ken Kutaragi and some other people from Sony travelled to Nintendo HQ with a proposition for them. He went to the management, and presumably in typical hip-cool-down-with-the-kids Sony fashion, was all... Yo, Nintendo! Sony is in the house and wants in on this gaming thing, in dog. Word. To which Nintendo's response was... Uh, sure. Yeah. Whatever. Just... Just don't break anything, okay? Success! Just like that, Sony had managed to get their foot in the door of the gaming industry, and managed to sign a deal with Nintendo. With the successor of the NES approaching, Sony would now build and supply the audio chips for the Super Nintendo. Now, Sony was quite pleased with this deal, since they secretly designed them to make decent sound development only possible with expensive Sony tools. But Sony wasn't just satisfied with that one deal. Wait, what's that sound? Can you hear that? A CD! Well, then it can only be one thing. The future! Yes, back in the day, the now commonplace CD was a mystical future creation. And it looked like it was going to be the route gaming was going to go down. Nintendo realised this, for they had in fact already invested in CDs a couple of years before. Meet the Famicom Disk System, 
Released in 1986, it was a device that attached to the base of the Famicom. Or, if you were lucky, you might get one which was already built in. Which, by the way, this thing looks, in my professional opinion, badass. Now, this system was home to a lot of big names, including the original Legend of Zelda and what would become Super Mario Bros. 2 here, Doki Doki Panic. So, if lots of big games were on the system, why didn't we get a Nintendo Entertainment System disc system? Well, apart from the terrible name, the device had a habit of breaking a lot, sometimes melting, and being generally unreliable. That's how we got many disc games on cartridge instead. And so it was branded a failure by Nintendo, although they continued to support repairs for it until 2004. The president of Nintendo was confident CDs were the route to go down. And now, CD gaming technology was gaining more public attention, particularly in the West and with other games companies. Nintendo yeah. was taking notice of this. While not confident in their Famicom disc system, they were determined to do it again and do it right with their next console. And Sony discovering this were very keen to use Nintendo's interest to their advantage, basically telling them, Yo, we can like so do this CD thing for you. Nintendo innocently thought it would be a good idea, considering how Sony had delivered on their promise for the sound chips, and invited them to strike up a new deal. So, both the heads of Sony and Nintendo met together to sign this deal. It was proposed that it would not simply build an add-on for the Super Nintendo, but instead create an entirely new console together, with the ability to play both SNES cartridges and new CD games. It seemed like a great idea, a chance for Sony to make their own console with the help of the most successful maker of them, and gave Nintendo the disk drive system they were hoping for. But of course things are never simple. Now, perhaps Nintendo were just too excited, or trustworthy of Sony, but they probably should have read into the contract they were signing a little closer, for Sony had a plan in motion. An evil plan. With the contract sorted, the console was dubbed the rather simple name of the Super Disc, and it was going to be made using both Nintendo and Sony's super secret technology that was supposedly 18 months from being released. As previously stated, it was going to be able to play both Super Nintendo cartridges and the CD-ROMs. The CDs Sony would be sole worldwide licensor of. With all this agreed upon and development ready to go, it seemed like everything was sorted. What could possibly go wrong? Well, okay, it didn't instantly crash and burn. In fact, for the most part, the first few years went fine and dandy. Both companies were working hard together to get this new system ready to show off. Nintendo was so confident in both CD technology and the project that they increased the research budget to help explore what they could do with it further. It wasn't until 1991, the year of the Super Nintendo release, that things went sour. And by sour I mean like a thousand lemons smacking you in the face repeatedly. Nintendo went back and looked at the deal they signed with Sony when they realised something that caused them alarm. A great deal of it. Nintendo must have felt awful about the mistake when they realised it. Sony's lawyers had skillfully manipulated the contract, so Sony got all control and licensing rights to the CD-based games, meaning they'd reap in all the publishing profits, the very profits Nintendo needed to keep. Realising this crazy CD thing was in no way a fluke and could create major business, Nintendo realised their alliance with Sony meant giving up a lot of their own business. This was something Nintendo could simply not let happen, and decided to fight Sony's cunning plan with a cunning plan of their own. And so they rushed off to find a solution. Yes sir, summertime in Chicago! Mondo Bizarro! This is exciting! I really like CES! What's that down there? Come on, what are you waiting for?
June 1991, two months before the Super Nintendo's US release, its first appearance on display at the Chicago CES. It was also going to be the reveal of the new system the two companies were working on within Sony's event during the show. Taking the stage, Sony proudly announced their partnership and gave the world a glimpse of the new console. Named the Nintendo PlayStation. Now, you'll have to forgive me here since I've no idea what the console officially looked like because as you can see there's a lot of different designs throughout development. The one you see centre stage seems to be however the most consistent with magazine articles from the time. But if you ever wondered why the PlayStation controller is basically a Super Nintendo one with some handles, a couple more buttons and some control sticks, well, here's your answer. It originally WAS a Super Nintendo controller. The PlayStation wasn't just there to play games and look pretty though. It would also play music and movies via Sony using other parts of its vast company to develop software. It was quite the surprise and gained a lot of attention. Sony left the stage very pleased. Fast forward 24 hours though and Nintendo had had all it could take. Sony had also retained all the rights to the Super Nintendo sound chip, forcing Nintendo more under their control. Time to put their revenge into action. At 9am, the day after Sony's reveal, Nintendo took the stage and showed off the Super Nintendo as planned, and then made a surprise announcement. In their attempt to get back at Sony, Nintendo had travelled to the mysterious European country known as the Netherlands. They announced instead of working with Sony, they were now working with Philips, Sony's long-time rival on a SNES CD, claiming their technology was superior. Nintendo played the old card of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Sony was humiliated and furious having found out about this the night before, trying to get in contact only to have their calls ignored. This could create serious backlash against Nintendo since they broke their contract and Sony tried to change their mind by threatening to sue, but Nintendo insisted to them that Our deal with Philips won't interfere with your little PlayStation thing which Sony begrudgingly accepted for now, since both companies still needed to maintain friendly relationships. The deal that was struck with Philips did seem like a much better one than the one with Sony, at least on paper. Philips agreed to develop a SNES CD drive and would give Nintendo full licensing control over the entire thing. In return, Philips also wanted to make a games console and Nintendo agreed they could use Nintendo characters and games for the new system. So now everything was looking a bit more promising, at least Philips or Sony would develop a CD drive for the Super Nintendo. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? around here. Ha <laughs> ha! Here's the problem. Too many toasters. You know what they say. All toasters toast toast. Oh. Only Link can defeat Ganon. Great! I'll grab my stuff! There is no time. Your sword is enough. Enough. My ship sails in the morning. I wonder what's for dinner. Oh boy! I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok! Oh, he made lots of spaghetti! Luigi, look! It's from Bowser! Dear pesky plumbers! The console that this resulted in was the infamous Philips CDI, which saw the light of day in 1991. And today when you think of it, you think, failure, rubbish, a catastrophic mess, mainly due to those two, him, that guy, and these. Heck, they're really the only reason anyone really remembers this console. Without them, I expect it's highly likely that the Philips CDI would have faded into obscurity, like so many other consoles. 
I mean, who remembers the Hyperscan or the Loopy? You haven't got a clue about the Apple Pippin, nor I bet the Laser Active. And just how many of you know about the Zebo? And that came out in just 2009 with a controller that looked like th that. I'm not even sure how you use it. Yet, the Philips CDI is still remembered, so basically, the point is, without any of these guys, perhaps there's a treasure trove of forgotten brilliance hidden behind them. Such classics as the wacky world of miniature golf and Scotland Yard Interactive and the ultimate Noah's Ark. Uh -huh. Well, it's not that bad. I mean, it's not the most gripping selection of games, but it's not that bad. But let's have a look at how they advertise. We'll be able to see the best of the best of what they've got to offer. I'm sure they can sell us that way. Say you're going to buy a CD player and you're thinking... <laughs> but then you hear about the next generation CD player. It's called CDI and it works with your TV to bring you the ultimate in movies, games and family entertainment. Awesome! Awesome is right. Awesome sound, awesome pictures, awesome choices. CDI! Tell a friend! CDI, kid, huh? Now get into CDI starting at $2.99 with $200 of free stuff. Right? No. Forget it. Let's rip this thing apart. You didn't even try, Phillips. You didn't even try. And you had plenty of time to do so. You started this whole thing back in 1984. Okay, admittedly, the focus of the CDI was split in several directions. There was a big focus on music and film. However, Games were definitely the biggest focus and selling point for most people. And because Philips started developing the software all the way back in 1984, they were in a really good position too. This was just when the video game market was beginning to recover. They saw the rise of Nintendo and Sega, giving them the perfect examples of what they should and shouldn't do and how to go about it. So the decisions they made to appeal to that audience are completely baffling. For example, the design of the system itself. It was intended to be the next must-have revolutionary thing to own, better than all the competition. So what did they do? How could they beat the stylish and simple designs of the two Super Nintendos? The coolness and the sleek look of the Mega Drive. What a wondrous creation did they present to the world to stand above all others? So yeah, their genius design was basically a big ugly black box that looked like every other 90s DVD and VHS player. But hey, don't worry, you don't like this design here? Well that's fine, because there's a whole other 18 different versions of the console to choose from. And that's not even including the 8 more professional CDI consoles you could find. I'm not even joking, this here is some of the many, many different types. This isn't even all of them. As you can see, a lot of them look like variations on the big black box idea, but you could also get a lot of portable ones, a strange wall mounted one, probably intended for places like hotels, one built into a speaker system, and another built in directly to the TV. There's really only one design that looks like it should have been a games console. This was created after they realised the system wasn't doing too great, so they really designed it as a budget games oriented version of the console, though it does look a tad like a barbecue to me. But they even messed this up. This one was aimed only at gamers, whereas the others did have stuff for everyone else. I mean, fair enough, it is a budget version of the console. But they decided it would be a great idea to remove the port for the second controller. So multiplayer games on the gaming version of the console were out of the question. Mind you, 
people had a hard enough time playing two player on the other consoles, mainly because they put the port for the second controller bizarrely on the back of the system. As for the games, platformers, RPGs and the standard kind of game you expect on something like the Super Nintendo or the Mega Drive were really not very common. Instead you got things like interactive self help guides and reference books, or documentaries about history. A ton of games were electronic versions of popular go. board games and toys like Connect 4, and another big selection was game show games like Jeopardy. A major focus though, due to the technology, was full motion video games, more commonly known as FMVs, basically games that played a video that would require you to normally click on things as it plays to interact with it and continue the game and story. These were games like the excellent Dragon's Lair and Space Ace. There was even a couple of decent exclusives that were made for the console, such as Burn Cycle, but a few good games weren't really enough to sell it to consumers. For one, many of the few good games could be found on other systems like the Sega CD. And as for Burn Cycle itself, well, due to being one of the few better games, it actually escaped the sinking SSCDI and ported itself to the PC. Not that you'd ever want to play it, even if it was still on the CDI, because the controls would have been abysmal. And that was only if you could find the right controller. There was a ton of them to pick from, ranging from a mouse and keyboard to drawing tablets and trackballs. And even if you had the right game and the right controller, there was still no guarantee you could play because certain controllers only worked on certain systems. So if your CDI couldn't use that controller, then you couldn't play. Out of all these different controllers, there was only a couple of actual video game ones. The first was based on the Super Nintendo one, and a later one similar to the Mega Drive was also released. The first one, this one here, had some odd features, like the ability to screw in a control stick. But hey, I know what you're thinking. Now a proper video game controller is nice and all, but what would really, what, what, what would really sell me on this console is the ability to play with some of the worst controls ever conceived. Well you're in luck. These four controllers here are the standard type of controller you're going to be using with your Philips CDI. That's right, Philips decided that this here was the future of the way we would play games. It was designed for use with one hand. The big disc in the middle was the D-pad and the buttons around the outside were the controls. So you either had to stop moving to do any other actions or try and cram two hands around it. Combined with the terrible lag some games had, these controls were the equivalent to someone asking you to do your violin exam while also running the London Marathon and they throw rocks at your shins. I mean, it's possible, but it's not going to be fun and the results will not be pretty. Actually, the best way I could describe it is if you bought the latest hit PS3 game but was forced to play the entire thing using the DVD remote control. To be honest, the best you're going to get out of most of the Philips CDI games is the interactivity of a DVD game. Hell, probably just a DVD menu. I mean, hey kids, throw out your Mega Man, we've got classic hit titles like Tic Tac Toe with all the playability of a styrofoam cup. What's that? You can play Tic Tac Toe for free already? But this is an electronic form, on the TV, which you can play for just the low, low price of $700. Right now though, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, this is all very good and whatnot, but what does this have to do with Nintendo vs Sony? Well, actually a ton more than you might expect. You see, this whole debacle happened during the SNES CD creation, and it severely affected Nintendo's view on CD-based gaming. In fact, for a while, they didn't even bother with Sony at all because of it, just letting them get on with whatever they were doing, but offering no longer any assistance. It's understandable as to why their view of CDs became so tainted. I mean, look at the examples they'd seen so far. Their Famicom Disk System was often breaking down to the point where they decided to not release it in the West. Sony, who had tried to convince them that CD-based gaming was the way to go, had proven themselves untrustworthy. Their biggest rival, Sega, was facing increasing issues with their own CD-based console, and Philips, the only people they had partnered with, had created a flop. 
And as for believing in Sony again, well, they'd partnered with their biggest rival, a group who creates similar technology with similar ideas. If technology giant Philips couldn't get results, why should they believe Sony could? Combined with the fact that CD-based gaming meant less space on the disc than a cartridge with longer loading times, is it any surprise that Nintendo came to distrust discs to the point where they didn't use them till the GameCube era? Even then, you could still see the remains of this distrust. The GameCube used special mini-discs so that Nintendo still had a bit more control over them. As for what Sony was up to during all of this, well, they went off and tried reimagining their console, now realising Nintendo wasn't willing to assist them. A few months after the CES incident, Sony revealed the PlayStation again at Tokyo International Electronics Show in October 1991. This time, it was portrayed as a gaming and educational console, with most of the presentation focusing on educational multimedia games. Gosh, doesn't that sound familiar? No games were actually shown since they were still trying to sign deals with publishers, but it was still able to play Super Nintendo games, and they aimed for a launch date of summer 1992, deliberately six months before the proposed release of the Philips Super Nintendo CD drive. This resulted in Nintendo announcing in January 1992 that they were abandoning their partnership with Sony, so bye bye Super Nintendo games on the PlayStation. Sony's response to this? Well, remember Sega? They had stayed out of this as much as possible, focusing on the Mega Drive and Super Nintendo rivalry instead. Sony was having none of this and so in CES 1992, decided to tell everyone that they planned to make CD games for the Sega CD that had just been launched the previous Christmas, just to get back in Nintendo. At the same CES, Philips announced that it still planned to work with Nintendo and that their Super Nintendo CD drive would be out by Christmas, though it would be pushed back to 1993 later in the year. Nintendo confirmed Philips' statement, and at this time even mentioned how they had full licensing control over the system, quite proudly. However, they were already becoming very dubious over the CDI, seeing most, if not all, the problems with it. Deciding that they didn't want to personally make games for the system, they compromised, and gave Philips the right to their characters, but stated they had to make the games. And thus it resulted in the infamous Zelda and Mario CDI games. Let's take a quick peek at them, shall we? So, let's start off with the most famous of the CDI games, The Legend of Zelda The Wonder Gamelon and The Faces of Evil. Even if you've never played a Zelda game, chances are if you've been on YouTube, you've seen clips from these two. As previously stated, Nintendo played no part in their development, but oddly enough, Philips didn't develop the games either. Instead, they were given to a small independent studio called Animation Magic, and it was simply funded by Philips. Philips made another baffling decision though. After they demanded the games use FMVs, high resolution graphics and CD quality music to show off the CDI to the best of its abilities, they then decided to give them a rather tiny budget of about £600,000, and then they had to split it between the two games. They were also given a single year to make them. That being said, Animation Magic didn't spend incredibly wisely, deciding to fly in four animators all the way from Russia to make the now famous cutscenes. Now today, the most common reaction to these games is a rage-filled BLARG! However, back then, it was a very different view of the games. They supposedly wowed the audiences at CES 1993 for its stunning animation and graphics. That's right. These things here... Breathtaking! Brilliant! Perfect animation! A reasonably good game! Okay, so it wasn't all high praise. You've got to be kidding. Now, let's move on to Zelda's Adventure. This Zelda CDI game is quite different to the other two, mainly because Philips gave it to a different company, this time called Viridis, 
And because, unlike the side-scrolling style of the animation magic games, this was a more traditional top-down view Zelda. And quite a lot of effort was put into this, which is why its tale is kind of tragic. First of all, they got some live action cutscenes and used real life photos for the background to add some realism, including helicopter shots of Santa Monica Boulevard and Hawaii and even some holiday snaps from the developers. While this looked nice, this unfortunately took up all the RAM, something that caused a lot of arguments within the team fighting over mere kilobytes of the stuff. Despite this, they still wanted to make the game look great, even making miniature models for every interior to keep the realistic look. They honestly really did have high hopes, even claiming early on that they hoped for 300 hours of content, but as development progressed and the game got more and more weighed down by the CDI's limitations, they ended up with only about 12 hours and got stuck in testing for a whole two years just to make it playable. That was longer than it took to make the game. The game ended up with overwhelmingly negative reviews for its intensely digitised graphics, terrible acting and the inability to produce sound effects and music at the same time. There will be no more viewing tonight. So, Hotel Mario. Unlike the other games, this one was actually made by Philips themselves in their own development studio called Funhouse Factory. And unlike the adventurous Zelda games, this one was a puzzle game. Unfortunately, there really isn't much information on the game's development. We know the hotels were redesigned at one point because they were dull and lifeless before, but other than that, it's a complete mystery. The game also got terrible reviews, some pointing out how odd it was to base your entire gameplay around opening and closing doors. That ought to do it! That's right, there's a forgotten Mario CDI game, one which actually sounded like it was going to be, are you ready for it, good. The only problem is, is that it was never released. Now, Super Mario's Wacky Worlds was intended to be a direct sequel to Super Mario World and was created by a small company called Nova Logic after the suggestion by a Nintendo executive to boost CDI sales by porting the simpler Super Nintendo games to the console. This resulted in the idea of making a sequel. Excited by the idea, Nova Logic worked for 24 hours a day for two weeks preparing a single level to show off to Nintendo, getting it ported to CD just in time with only four hours to spare. And they actually managed to greatly impress Nintendo, hey, really but despite cool, this, the project was destined to fail. Although the praise from the big N, Nintendo had lost all faith in the CDI and cancelled the project though the lead designers did expect this to happen. Upon its final version before cancellation, around 80% of the art, 95% of the design and 30% of the code was complete, and you can even get a pre-alpha download of it online. Though bear in mind it is a pre-alpha version, it's not exactly complete and not exactly very playable. And now a real Japanese guy from a really big Japanese company in Japan. こんにちは。私は本物の日本人なんですけれども、作なゲーム。
なんだそこにいたんですかどうやら CM の時間のようですからトイレに行くにはちょうどいいですよ私は腰布の一枚だけをつけた野蛮人たちが繰り広げる戦いを存分に楽しみたいと思いますおい早く俺を上にあげろスコッティあ彼はもう死んでるよジェームダメ僕は医者だレンガ職人じゃないんだ僕は何を言ってるんだろうこの。It would be a lie to say the relationship between Nintendo, Philips, and Sony were at their best right now. At that point in time, Nintendo was actually suing Sony for trying to use the name PlayStation, which they claim they owned. Let's have a quick recap as to why all this was happening. Nintendo and Sony were making a Super Nintendo CD drive, which eventually evolved into making the Nintendo PlayStation. Things went Well, until Sony went behind Nintendo's back so that only they could make substantial profit from it. Instead of talking to Sony, Nintendo then went behind their back and hired their biggest rival, Philips, to make the Super Nintendo CD drive instead. Part of the deal allowed Philips to use Nintendo characters on their CDI console. The CDI console was awful. Sony now had to continue without Nintendo's help on the PlayStation, eventually breaking all ties with them. Nintendo wasn't fond of Philips because of how disastrous their console was, but was still hoping a Super Nintendo CD could be made. And now, the thrilling conclusion! <laughs> You know, Nintendo were viewed as jerks back in the day. Apart from the consumer, everyone, and I mean everyone, hated them. While they loved and admired them for bringing back the games industry, the practices Nintendo was employing were a little to be desired. Say you're a game developer and you want to make a game for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Okay, well, that's great! Apart from the fact you need to get permission from Nintendo to do so. Nintendo's lockout chip was developed to stop piracy and shovelware in hopes of avoiding another video game crash. Whilst it did indeed work, their restrictions were perhaps too strict. It meant only they could produce the cartridges, so to make your game, you must first buy a development kit from Nintendo, sign all kinds of deals with Nintendo to get your game sold and approved, buy every single one of the cartridges off Nintendo to then sell it to shops. Try and pitch your game to consumers to make money, and money you do make, the majority of it goes back to Nintendo because you use their tools, their console, and their cartridges to make it. Any profits you did get was measly compared to what the big end got. So, back when Sony got the bright idea to word their contract in a certain way so they made the most money, is it any real surprise that they did? They wanted to enter the game market, they couldn't do that with the measly profit they'd get. They'd even tried approaching a deal beforehand, but had been turned down. Now, I'm not saying what Sony did nor what Nintendo did is good or bad. It's business after all. If you've got a great product, you're going to want to get lots and lots of profits. But I think it does show that, frankly, neither of these guys are the good or bad guy. Anyway. <laughs> The final chapter into the origins of this rivalry begins with a group of executives from Nintendo's largest licenses meeting with Hiroshi Yamauchi, the head of Nintendo, in October 1992. The reason was quite simple various gaming publishers were sick to death of all the different CD formats, meaning porting games to different systems was a pain. Now, because Nintendo and Sony were both making new CD platforms, they decided they needed to do something about it before it was too late, and they had another set of CDs. So basically, they practically demanded that Nintendo, Sony, and Philips work out their differences. Not having much choice, the three companies met once again. Well, it turns out some rather interesting revelations came out at this meeting. Turns out Nintendo wasn't the first to give Philips a hand with the CDI. 
Sony had in fact worked with Philips way back during the very early days of CDI development to make the console together by creating the format of CD that the console would go on to use. The two swiftly began disagreeing with each other and fell out, meaning Sony then went to Nintendo after, only for Nintendo to then go after Philips. The entire fiasco had come full circle. Eventually these three came to an agreement. All companies would create software that used the same format of CD worldwide. Nintendo and Sony also had a bit of a heart to heart to work out their differences. Sony even came out and admitted that they needed to ally with them since Nintendo was clearly the 16-bit console winner. With the reunion, it was decided that now Nintendo, Philips and Sony were all going to make the Super Nintendo CD drive together and boost it up to a 32-bit machine to beat out the 16-bit competitors. Nintendo got back the right to control all licenses for games on the PlayStation and the SNES CD, while Sony got the license all non-game stuff for the system, stuff like edutainment and movies. And Philips, well they got, um, um well, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's something here, well Philips, yeah they got, <clears throat> moving on. So, while this all sounds all good and dandy, things have a habit of going wrong when it comes to these three. For instance, Nintendo had begun to lose all interest in even making a Super Nintendo CD drive. Technically, it could now be done very quickly and released, but the Super Nintendo on its own with just the cartridges was doing just fine, raking in the millions for Nintendo. Plus, if they took a look at how the market was responding to, say, Sega's Mega CD, it wasn't good news. In fact, Nintendo was practically ignoring the project themselves now, leaving the others to make it. They were far more interested in just updating the Super Nintendo without add-ons. Two months earlier, in August 1992, Nintendo revealed the Super FX chip. This was packaged inside the cartridges, so people didn't have to go out and buy something extra. For those of you not in the know, the Super FX chip allowed for basic 3D graphics, which for the time was pretty damn revolutionary. This included games like Star Fox and Stunt Race FX. It also helped out in scaling with 2D games like Yoshi's Island, meaning that the console could scale enemies that were tiny into huge ones. There was even a sequel to the chip, though not many games use it. Star Fox 2 was going to use that, but it was uh, it was cancelled. Hmm, guess we're gonna have to revisit that. Basically, the point is the Super FX was pretty damn amazing. And now, the CD drive and the PlayStation would need to be much better to sell it to consumers. After all, if you can get the game quality without buying the expensive add-on or a whole new console, then what's the point? And so for seven months, Nintendo, Sony and Philips fell completely silent on the projects. In May 1993, Nintendo finally spoke about the Super Nintendo CD project and gave a release date of Autumn 1994 with a price of about $200. Supposedly, they already had a Zelda and a Street Fighter being made for it, and they promised the CD drive's final design would be shown at CEX in a few months. They lied. Instead, Super Mario All-Stars got shown off, alongside some other Super FX games. So where did the Super Nintendo CD go? Well, the answer is quite simple. The future had arrived, but now it had become the past. Why work on a 32-bit console when it was clear nobody cared about it? Nintendo had proven 16 bits were still profitable with games like Donkey Kong Country, which was released as a direct response to 32-bit contenders, and had sold out everywhere. No, what they needed was something bigger and more impressive. Something to wow people, not something similar to their competitors like Sony and Philips' 32-bit machines. They needed the power of both these consoles combined. They needed 64 bits. Enter the Nintendo, or rather, the Ultra 64 as it was called at the time. Nintendo had set up a new partnership with Silicon Graphics to make 3D 64-bit games. With this in place, and seeing how promising early tests were, releasing a Super Nintendo add-on would be obsolete. Otherwise it would be like adding on a life support machine to a console that was in its later years. In many ways, Sega did the exact opposite. 
So the Super Nintendo CD came to an end, and apparently never made it past prototype stage, nor did any of the software. But, more importantly, what happened to the PlayStation? After all the extra development time, it had pretty much been completed. Yeah, that's right, finished, ready to go and ship out the door. There was a grand total of 200 already made. While after Nintendo stopped the Super Nintendo CD, it was clear that the PlayStation was going to be next. Not wanting to go through that whole fiasco again, Sony abandoned the PlayStation. Or did they? Turns out Sony snuck away with the PlayStation technology both they and Nintendo were working on, and began working it into a system of their own. First of all, they were sick of Nintendo, and with the partnership now fully terminated, they removed the ability to play Super Nintendo games on the system before anything else. Then they decided it was time for a little payback, and then set to work reworking everything to make it a contender against the Nintendo 64. They might not be able to get the 64 bits Nintendo had, but they were determined to steal the market from under them, with high quality games and stealing some exclusives to their own. Not only that, but they already owned a near complete console already. They could beat everyone else to the market. You can probably imagine the reaction Nintendo had when a few months later Sony stepped out of the shadows to reveal their plans. That's right folks, it's lawsuit time! And how did they do it? Well, they tried the exact same method, of course, claiming that they owned the name to the PlayStation. It didn't work the first time, it didn't work the second. In fact, Sony went out of its way to agree to change the name, only to then simply remove the space between the words. Or was this a final kick in the teeth to Nintendo? And thus, Sony planned to release its very first console. And oh boy, was the gaming world in a frightened panic. Sony was essentially releasing a Nintendo console as their own, and Nintendo had always been the top dogs. This could change everything. Admittedly, Sony claimed they'd reworked the entire system and wasn't anything like the Nintendo version, but I kinda doubt that myself, given the time span. Either way, Sony had learned straight from the best, and now every company was in fear. Sega panicked so much that they made a surprise announcement on May 11th, 1995, and the very first E3, that instead of the original September release date for the Sega Saturn, it was going on sale right then, right now, which meant half the retailers didn't have any stock. Those that didn't felt outraged and refused to stock the system throughout its entire lifetime, and those that did have the system didn't have enough. Atari, on the other hand, tried to big up their console to beat Sony, claiming that the Jaguar was in fact the first 64-bit console, when in reality, it was a 32-bit graphics system and another 32-bit sound system stuck together. Nintendo? Well, not wanting to lose any of their customers, announced none other than the Virtual Boy at the same E3, because there was already tons of delays to the Nintendo 64. And it was not just 32-bits like the PlayStation, but portable too. But I think we know how that turned out. With Sega in a right state, and Sony still annoyed at Nintendo, the true rivalry commenced. Nintendo had stuck with cartridges, meaning they kept the old licensing agreement, but had far bigger space, and faster than the CDs. They mocked Sony with this, with various ad campaigns. Sony, on the other hand, retaliated with ad campaigns of their own. At one point, they got a guy dressed as Crash Bandicoot, drive up to Nintendo of America HQ and begin taunting Nintendo down a microphone while showing off the PlayStation at the same time. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Pack up your stuff. I got a little surprise for you here. Check it out. What do you think about that? We got real time, 3D, lush organic environments. How's that make you feel, buddy? You feel a little like your days are numbered? I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. You're hurting my elbow. Is that Italian? No, Bandicoot, it's an Australian name. Nintendo remained confident in their system. That was until the sales started. The PS1 was a gigantic hit, the first console to ship over 100 million systems worldwide. Nintendo wasn't out though, it still had several great first party hits and constantly kept on. 
but for the first time ever, they were always in second place. Even to game makers themselves, it's a well known tale of how Final Fantasy left Nintendo consoles for PlayStation since Nintendo insisted on keeping on cartridges, which by now were very expensive to make. Nintendo even tried to gain some support back with the 64 disk drive, which was similar to the Super Nintendo CD and was actually released too. Only to flop because CD gaming was cheaper everywhere else. And at the end of it all, gaming would never be the same again. Who knows what would have happened if Nintendo had stuck to its guns and continued working with Sony. I expect honestly, not much. Sony would have always eventually left to make their own console, just maybe a few years later and under a different name. In fact, I expect they still would have beaten the Nintendo 64, and the PlayStation would have been just one of those forgotten systems while the new Sony console stole the limelight. The only change may have been the friendly relationships between the two companies, and who knows, maybe we would have seen Ratchet and Clank in Smash Bros. But at the end of it all, these two were always destined to be rivals. Wow, so that was the origin of Nintendo vs Sony. Pretty exciting stuff, right? Well, that's nothing compared to the console war a few years prior. After all, both companies came out okay, right? Unlike the slow, painful death of the last company to challenge Nintendo. I mean, what's the point of a good war without a fatality in there somewhere? Hey, thanks for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed this very slowly released trilogy. Don't worry, new episodes should be coming out far more frequently from now on for at least a few months. I recommend following me on Twitter if you want to get regular updates on new videos, and don't forget to leave a like or a comment, and subscribe as well, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you did. If you can't wait for my next video, go check out some of my other ones, like my show Memory Card, where we go over forgotten gaming trivia, or catch up on the previous episode of From Concept to Console. I'll see you guys next time.